You don't mind if we record it, do you? Nope, not at all. All right, well, we'll start at five after. I'm going to turn my screen share off and let you uh, throw yours up there and we'll proceed. That sounds like a plan. I know that we're always, sometimes it takes time to get connected. <laughs> kind right. of a sign of our times. Yeah, what was my login again? <laughs> Okay, well, we'll start. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining us. Uh, we're we're uh, honored today to have a, a really good speaker. Annie Martone is the president and CEO of Hesse Martone, which is a labor and employment law firm with national national reach and offices in three different cities. Um, Annie's rated AV preeminent, which is a peer-reviewed uh, ranking um, done by Martindale Hubble. Uh, where peer, peer lawyers rank each other. Uh, and that preeminent level is the highest level of professional excellence uh, based on legal knowledge, communication skills, and ethical standards. He has 29 years of experience in practice. Uh, he's experienced in negotiations, arbitration, unfair labor practices, employment litigation, and federal and state courts. And he's uh, practiced in 49 different states. Uh, in his prior life, and he worked for one of the big three automakers, and uh, is a frequent speaker on topics such as the Central States Pension Fund, Human Resources, Union Negotiations, Americans with Dis Disabilities Act Compliance, and OSHA, among other things. So, Andy, thank you for joining us, and um, uh, the floor is yours. Well, thank you for the kind words. Uh, actually, I wish I only had 29 years of experience. Uh, it's 34 uh, years now. <laughs> all right. And good morning, everybody. Thank you for having me. I very much appreciate your being here. You know, these Zoom meetings are now very much a sign of our times. Uh, there were a couple of things I wanted to go over before we get started. Uh, thing number one is there is probably little on earth that is more boring than listening to a lawyer read a PowerPoint. And so from that perspective, if during the course of this, anybody has any questions or comments or wants to clarify something, please just either jump in with the chat or jump in with a question. You know, a lot of the time as we're going through things, it's a lot more meaningful if we can discuss it as the subject comes up. Uh, that's especially true with the Inflation Reduction Act because there are a lot of moving parts. And so please put your questions in the chat and I'll address them just as soon as they come up. Uh, the second thing is I'm a 34 year labor lawyer. I am not a tax attorney and I am not a CPA. And what I know about corporate taxation dances on the head of a pin. That's why I call my accountant. So if you have any questions today about tax implications, IRS or treasury processes, or how the tax incentives work, I'm not that guy. And that's a good question for your tax attorney or for your CPA. Uh, finally, at the conclusion of this, we'll make the PowerPoint available to everybody. But in addition to that, if during the course of the presentation, you think of something, but it doesn't occur to you until tomorrow when you wake up and say, oh, my God, I wish I had asked that, please feel free just to send us an email and we'll get back to you right away. So now, with no further ado, I'm going to see if I can once again successfully share a screen in Zoom. Success. I, I never cease to be amazed when this works. Okay. 
Uh, the Inflation Reduction Act of 2022, and sometimes I'll refer to it as the IRA, was signed into law on August 16th, 2022. Uh, for purposes of our presentation today, we're just going to cover that it directs significant federal spending towards reducing carbon emissions, funding the Internal Revenue Service, and improving taxpayer compliance with the law. It included $394 billion, with a B, to renewable energy and federal funding toward the construction and operation of renewable energy, which includes wind farms and solar farms, although it's not only about wind farms and solar farms. And these funds are delivered through a mixture of tax incentive grants and loan guarantees. In other words, for IRA projects, the government is not the direct contracting authority, but instead it is granting tax incentives and loan guarantees to the contracting authorities, to the owners, to the developers, et cetera. The majority of this $394 billion is in the form of tax credits and $216 billion worth of these tax credits will go to corporations. Uh, most of these, many, but actually most of these incentives are what we call direct pay, which means that an entity can claim the full amount even if its tax liability is less than the credit. So in other words, these are not just offset tax credits but they are direct pay credits and you can receive the full amount of the credit even if your taxes are less than the credit. However, there are strings attached with regard to the construction, alteration and repair of renewable energy sources, including wind farms and solar farms. Uh, the IRA prevailing wage and apprenticeship provisions, and those are the two main strings we're gonna talk about today, apply to the following. Alternative fuel or fueling property credits production tax credits, tax credits for carbon oxide sequestration, credits for the production of clean hydrogen, although we're still fighting over what clean hydrogen really is, clean fuel production credits, investment tax credits, advanced energy project credits, and even energy efficient commercial building deductions. So it will apply to vertical construction when we're talking about energy efficient commercial building deductions. The types of facilities that these tax incentives apply to include, number one, facilities that produce electricity from renewable resources. And this is probably the main source of the immediate construction. Wind, biomass, geothermal, solar, landfill gas, trash, qualified hydropower, marine and hydrokinetic resources. It also will include energy storage facilities, industrial carbon capture or direct air capture facilities, energy efficient commercial buildings under special circumstances, qualified nuclear facilities. Uh, it's been in the news a lot recently about all the electric vehicle charging stations that we're going to require to charge all the electric vehicles that are going to be sold. The alternative vehicle refueling properties, those electric vehicle charging stations will be covered by IRA tax incentives. It will also apply to specific advanced energy projects in manufacturing or industrial facilities, clean hydrogen facilities, and clean fuel production facilities. So it will apply to a wide variety of facilities which touch the whole idea of clean or renewable energy. In order to qualify for these increased tax benefits, the Inflation Reduction Act amended the Internal Revenue Code to add prevailing wage requirements and minimum apprenticeship requirements for constructing, altering, or repairing qualified clean energy facilities. I'm going to stop at this point and to make a point, which is many of us are used to Davis-Bacon or state prevailing wage projects, and we're used to dealing with the Department of Labor on those projects. The Department of Labor does play a significant, a significant role in administering the Inflation Reduction Act. But one thing that's important to remember is unlike Davis-Bacon, at the end of the day, the Department of the Treasury and the Internal Revenue Service will be the body that is in charge of the IRA administration and tax credits. So although DOL plays a role, it's a new federal agency we haven't dealt with as much in the construction context, the IRS. With regard to the start date, the qualification date has already passed. Projects are required to meet the prevailing wage and apprenticeship requirements for facilities where construction begins on or after January 29th, 2023. So it has literally been in effect for an entire month. Uh, I'm going to move now to the prevailing wage requirements. Uh, those of you who are familiar with Davis-Bacon will recognize this language, which is that all laborers, mechanics, 
must be paid the applicable prevailing wage, including fringe benefits, for all hours spent performing construction, alteration, or repair on the site of work of a qualified facility. Uh, the prevailing wage under Davis-Bacon, as applied to the Inflation Reduction Act, is the aggregate of the hourly wage rate and any applicable fringe benefit rates. Some examples of those fringe benefit rates include life insurance, health insurance, and pension plans, probably the two biggest, vacation pay, holiday pay, and paid sick leave. That's not an exhaustive list, that's an example list. The workers who are covered will be those workers who perform primarily manual or physical work in the construction trades or occupations, uh, the typical trades we're used to dealing with, including but not limited to electricians, iron workers, carpenters, equipment operators, truck drivers, and general laborers. I'm gonna pause for a second to emphasize the inclusion of truck drivers. There's been some controversy under Davis-Bacon whether truck drivers are performing prevailing wage work and the Department of Labor is in the middle of trying to implement a new rule relating to transportation drivers. It's important to note that in the IRA, truck drivers are explicitly listed. They're explicitly mentioned. Now, people who are not included are timekeepers, inspectors, architects, engineers, and employees whose duties are primarily administrative, executive, or clerical. So generally speaking, the IRA's prevailing wage and apprenticeship requirements apply to the construction trades, but that's a generalization that's got a lot of room underneath it for interpretation. The type of work that is considered covered work, and again, those of you who work with Davis Bacon will be familiar with this, is the type of work done on the facility, including altering, remodeling, installation, painting, decorating, the manufacturing or furnishing of materials or equipment on the site of work or at a contiguous dedicated site and the transportation between the project site and an off-site facility dedicated to the construction of the work which is deemed part of the site of the work. Maintenance work is not included. So for some more shorthand or easier to apply definitions, Construction generally means preparing a site for improvements and or making improvements to the land that become part of the site. Uh, the important takeaway from there that may be something to consider is site preparation is construction under the IRA. The alteration of a project includes making an addition, subtraction, or change to an existing structure that affects the structure or its performance. So changes that affect a structure or performance are alterations and also covered by the requirements for the prevailing wage rate. Finally, repair means a singular or one-time fix to a component system or aspect of the facility that is no longer working as intended. In other words, a one-time fix to something that's broken. And that's to be distinguished from maintenance, and maintenance is not covered by the prevailing wage requirements, and is defined as keeping a structure, a fixture, or foundation in proper condition on a routine scheduled or anticipated fashion. And so repair work, one-time fix to something that's broken, maintenance, regularly scheduled upkeep. The offsite manufacture of construction components will generally not be covered by the IRA as long as they are not manufactured at a dedicated or contiguous location. This is a somewhat parallel construction with Davis-Bacon. And what it means is that if we have a contiguous location, a next door location, or a dedicated location for manufacturing off-site components, it can be covered by the prevailing wage requirements of the Inflation Reduction Act. In order to determine the appropriate prevailing wage rate, uh, the IRS is not going to be reinventing the wheel. Instead, it's going to be utilizing the Department of Labor wage determinations under Davis-Bacon. Uh, these wage determinations will be location-based, typically based on the county or the locale where the work is being performed. Uh, one thing that's important to note is work on solar and wind farms is generally considered to be heavy construction. And that's compared to building construction. It's the highest paid category, typically under the prevailing wage determination. So solar farms, wind farms are heavy construction. There will be no separate classifications for renewable energy work. After the Inflation Reduction Act passed, 
the Department of the Treasury, IRS, and DOL got together and they started working on regulations and interpretations under the IRA. At that point in time, there was a consideration given to creating separate categories of energy workers, for example, solar worker or wind farm worker. That was rejected ultimately by a treasury and there are no separate classifications for renewable energy work. And so what that means is that the prevailing wages are based upon the existing construction classifications under Davis-Bacon. Uh, laborers, electricians, equipment operators, iron workers, carpenters, and truck drivers. And again, truck drivers are explicitly mentioned. Uh, one of the most important points I'm going to make today is the point I'm going to make right now, which is Contractors and subcontractors can request clarification from the Department of Labor at a specific email address set aside just for IRA prevailing wage compliance. And everyone who has any doubt whatsoever about the appropriate wage category should do so to create a paper trail. Uh, that's because, as we'll see in a little bit, the penalties for missing or guessing wrong are severe and their penalties are substantially increased. There's a multiplier if it's viewed that we acted in bad faith. And so it's absolutely essential we document the decision-making process on the front end of a project to create a paper trail with the Department of Labor. Now, I'm also gonna tell you, I have nine clients now who have tried to use this email to obtain prevailing wage clarification. None of them have gotten a response from DOL yet. And so, you know, DOL is a little bit behind in terms of answering these questions, but it's still important to ask to establish good faith. It's also important to know that the prevailing wage provisions of the IRA are not limited to employees. They also apply to independent contractors and will probably expand, be expanded to include owner operators of transportation systems. Uh, some of the specifics in dealing with the prevailing wage are that when a worker works in more than one classification, they have to be paid the different rates as applicable to each classification. We have to keep accurate time records and no estimating is allowed. And so if we break that down, but let's assume we have someone who's doing cleanup work, which is classified as laborer work. And then that person jumps on a bulldozer to do some heavy cleanup work and operating a bulldozer is normally considered equipment operator work. Well, if that person spent six hours cleaning up and two hours operating the bulldozer, number one, we would have to keep accurate time records showing what tasks were performed when. And then number two, they would have to be paid six hours at the laborer rate and two hours at the equipment operator rate. And if we don't do that, if we don't keep those records, then they have to be paid the entire time at the highest rate for the tasks they performed. So our hypothetical laborer jumping on a bulldozer would qualify for equipment operator rates the entire time they were working that day. If they spent part of that day doing a higher classification of work and we did not document time records that show the difference. So Andy, on that, on that point, that just emphasizes to me the need to clarify from the DOL which classification uh, applies to what kind of work. Um, if they're using one trade that you're not signatory to as a contractor for that scope of work, you need to know before you submit a bid. Is that is that the implication? Well, absolutely on the money. It's very important. And that's especially true because depending upon where we're working, sometimes the answer is different. You know, if we go to the issue of a solar farm, for example, right now there's a lot of union intra craft jurisdictional battling going on in terms of who erects the racking and who installs the modules on a solar farm. And in some places, it's the carpenters. In some places, it's the laborers. In some places, it's the IBEW, the electricians. And if you are doing work in an area where the electricians are considered to be doing that work as the prevailing craft and the prevailing rate, and you're using laborers, you're not insulated by the fact that you have a collective bargaining agreement with the laborers that covers the work. You still are required to pay the higher level for the prevailing wage. And so literally the prevailing wage is based upon locale, not necessarily on craft, which means there is no national determination as to who does what work and it may vary in regions. And so that's why it's critical, you know, as you point out, Tim, to check in and make sure we verify this. 
One of the other pieces we were arguing over at the when the regulations were going through is whether there would be a certified payroll requirement, similar to Davis Bacon's certified payroll requirement. Uh, there was a lot of back and forth on it, but at the end of the day, Treasury decided not to require a certified payroll. And instead, they used the IRS standard for record keeping, which is contractors must maintain written records sufficient to establish that all laborers and mechanics working on the site of work have been paid the applicable prevailing wage rate for all of their hours worked and that apprenticeship ratios were properly followed. Uh, this is an important distinction because while we may be used to submitting certified payrolls, which are sworn documents with legal significance, now we're essentially going to be required to maintain a standard of record keeping sufficient to survive an IRS audit. So in other words, Good record keeping will be crucial on the projects. It's not enough to throw a bunch of time cards into a construction trailer. We're going to have to do a really good job of keeping records for who's doing what work when and where. That's because the penalties for violations are severe. If we go back to our example of our laborer operating the bulldozer, first of all, the first remedy is the employee who is underpaid, who is paid an inappropriate rate is entitled to be paid the difference plus interest. In addition, however, the contractor can pay or will pay a penalty of $5,000 times the total number of laborers and mechanics who are paid below the prevailing rate. And then I'm going to stress these next five words for any period of time. So if we go back to our example of the laborer operating the bulldozer, even if it was only two hours worth of violation, that's a $5,000 penalty. Similarly, if we are paying a prevailing wage rate for, say, carpenters for installing modules on a solar farm, and the DOL determines that in the region you're working in, it's electricians and not carpenters rate that is the prevailing wage rate then we would owe $5,000 times the total number of workers who were underpaid based on the prevailing rate. So if you add 100 carpenters who were paid the carpenter rate when the DOL decides the IBW rate's really the prevailing rate, that's 100 times $5,000, even if it only happened on one day. In addition to that, if the failure is due to what, the, what they're going to refer to as intentional disregard, the penalties get much more substantial. And so this is why, as we discussed earlier, it's crucial to establish we are acting in good faith, that we're doing our best to comply with the law. Because if the DOL and Treasury determine that we are acting in intentional disregard, then workers will be entitled to three times the amount of the difference between the amount they should have been paid and the amount they were paid. And the penalty multiplier will become $10,000 per worker who was underpaid for any period of time. So the penalties can be substantial. Uh, question was, will you please share the PowerPoint and audio recording? Uh, absolutely, the PowerPoint will be available after the presentation. And we'll share the recording as well. Thank you for the question. Uh, does anybody have any other questions or any other things they'd like to clarify concerning the prevailing wage section before we move on to the apprenticeship section? And again, if you think backwards or come up with something, please just feel free to add it to the chat. Yeah, Andy, I, I have one that this is the second time that I've I've heard this law described. One thing that came to mind was how would a contractor know that the IRA and its provisions apply to a project? Well, typically speaking, that would be in the contract documents. Because if an owner is on this type of project and they're looking for tax incentives, one of the things they're going to want to do is flow down the requirements of compliance to the contractor. And so I think it will definitely be disclosable in the contract documents, similar to the way that the Department of Labor puts Davis-Bacon language in contracts, or most states put state prevailing language into contracts. So I think that that flow down is one of the things that will be important. Now, at some point in time, there is going to be a regulation that covers exactly what disclosures are made, but we are just not there yet. And that also reminds me, though, both the Department of Labor and the IRS through Treasury are regularly posting updates on their website 
concerning the rules for IRA compliance. And sometimes they change their pre-existing posts. And so if you want to stay up on this subject, you know, unfortunately, having a PowerPoint and listening to a presentation are not going to be enough because these requirements are a moving target. And so because the penalties for compliance are so substantial, one of the things that's going to be important is making sure that we stay up on the current interpretations. That's a good question. Thank you. Now we're going to move on to the apprenticeship requirements. And just as a matter of law, a certain number of hours of construction, alteration, or repair work must be performed by qualified apprentices on an IRA project. Uh, the first requirement is a labor hour requirement. And that is that there is a percentage of the total hours of construction, alteration, and repair work that have to be done by qualified apprentices. And qualified apprentices is a defined term. Second, the IRA work is subject to any applicable ratio requirement for apprentices to journey workers. Uh, typically, there are ratio requirements that appear either in collective bargaining agreements or sometimes in apprenticeship program trust agreements or plan documents that define how many apprentices you can have per journey worker. You know, today I'm just going to use an example of two to one. So you can have two apprentices for every journey worker on a project, and that's just for hypothetical purposes. The third requirement is that any contractor or subcontractor who employs four or more individuals to perform construction, alteration, and repair work has to employ at least one qualified apprentice to perform the work. In other words, even if it's a small contractor or a specialty contractor, there has to be one qualified apprentice to actually perform the work. So there's a labor hour requirement, the ratio is a percentage of the total hours. We have to meet the ratio requirement of apprentices to journey workers, and also small and specialty subcontractors have to meet a participation requirement of a minimum of one qualified apprentice if they have four or more employees performing covered work. The current ratios are 12.5% of the hours in 2023 this year, and then after this year and through every year that the IRA is in effect, 15% of the hours. And so if we had a project that had a million work hours on it, just performing covered work, what that would mean is it would mean that 125,000 of those hours would have to be performed by qualified apprentices. And then next year and moving forward, 150,000 of those hours would have to be performed by qualified apprentices. In terms of qualifications, to be qualified, an apprentice has to be participating in, and I'm going to stop for a second, that's a present tense, must be participating in, which means that if an apprentice graduates an apprenticeship program in the middle of a project and becomes a journey worker, they are no longer a qualified apprentice, even if they were when the project started. But an apprentice must be participating in a registered apprenticeship program registered under the National Apprenticeship Act that meets the requirements of federal regulations. And these registered apprenticeship programs are either approved by the US DOL or approved by a state apprenticeship agency and recognized by the US DOL. And so for sources of apprentices, Employers who wish to hire an apprentice in a registered apprenticeship program can either participate in an existing registered apprenticeship program or register their own program. Employers who want to participate in an existing registered program may be required to comply with the requirements for that program, including signing a collective bargaining agreement. And so kind of taking a step back to the question Tim had asked earlier, if a craft is on the project and we do not have a collective bargaining agreement with that craft and we want qualified apprentices to meet the apprenticeship ratios. And if then we send, you know, if we call for apprentices and say, hey, we need three operating engineers on this project. The apprenticeship program is within its rights in saying, in order for us to send you apprentices, you have to be either signatory to a collective bargaining agreement or some sort of participation agreement. And so, in other words, if we're going to request apprentices, we have to qualify to request those apprentices. And that can include being signatory to an agreement mandated by the plan. Uh, this is a map showing the different state and federal agencies. Uh, the light blue represent those states where the Federal Office of Apprenticeship does the registration. 
The dark blue are the recognized state apprenticeship agencies. And so in Ohio, we are a recognized state apprenticeship agency state. These next two slides, I'm not expecting you to read them or remember them, but what these are are samples of different crafts that are covered by apprenticeship programs. And that's two pages with a lot of very fine print. There are literally more types of apprentices than we can list. When we talk about the rates for apprentices, apprentices can be paid an apprenticeship rate below the applicable prevailing wage rate if there are sufficient journey workers on the site to ensure that the apprenticeship program ratio is met. So in other words, if there are two apprentices to one jerk journey worker, and if that is the ratio under either the contract or the trust agreement, then that is, or the plan document, then that ratio means that those apprentices can be paid the lower apprentice ratio rate if we meet the requirements. However, there's a chat question. If the ratio is not met, then I'm going to, again, emphasize these next four words because they show up as emphasized. On any given day, the apprentices must be paid the full prevailing wage rate for the classifications in which they are performing work. Uh, let's go back to our example of two operating engineer apprentices for one journey worker. Let's assume we have two journey workers, two journey worker operating engineers, and four apprentices on the program. One of the operating engineer journey workers gets sick and doesn't show up. And so what that means is we have four apprentices to one journey worker, which does not comply with the ratio requirements. If the ratio is not met on that day, then all of those apprentices must be paid the full prevailing wage rate for the classification in which they are performing work or operator work in this case. So one journey worker can, missing can throw our ratios off. This is another example of where good record keeping is important because if on that example, we don't catch it, we're missing one of our journey workers, we're out of ratio, the law requires us to pay full prevailing wage for those apprentices and we don't, then we've also violated the prevailing wage requirement for four workers, and that's a $20,000 penalty for any part or any day that it's not met. So making a mistake on the ratio requirements can be very expensive, not only on the apprenticeship hour side, but also on the prevailing wage side, because if we miss the ratio requirements and don't pay the apprentices appropriately, it's $5,000 per apprentice per day, or not per day for all of them, but $5,000 for that day. With regard to apprenticeships and fringe benefits, if an apprenticeship agreement allows for a lower or percentage fringe benefit rates to be paid, then the contractor can pay the lower rate. If the apprenticeship agreement is silent on fringe benefits, then the apprentice must be paid the full fringe benefit rates set forth in the prevailing wage determination. And so what this means is for purposes of our collective bargaining agreements, if our collective bargaining agreements have ratio payments for apprentices, or if the apprenticeship plan documents or trust agreements have those, if they do not explicitly limit payment for apprentice fringe benefit rates to the same ratio, then you've got to pay the full fringe benefit load. And again, making a mistake in this regard also subjects us to the $5,000 per worker who's not getting the appropriate prevailing wage penalty. If you're only going to remember one thing I say about apprentices, besides keep good records, which I'm going to say about everything, remember the good faith effort exception. You know, I think everybody is aware of the fact that we're really having a difficult time staffing construction work from the construction trades these days. And there is a shortage of good apprentices in a lot of different programs. So qualified apprentices are hard to find. There is a safe harbor built into the law as far as the good faith effort exception is concerned. And what that safe harbor provides that is that a contractor or subcontractor has met the apprenticeship requirements if they have, number one, requested qualified apprentices from a registered apprenticeship training program, and the request has either been denied or the program does not respond within five business days. 
And so if you request qualified apprentices from a registered apprenticeship training program and they don't send them or they deny your request, then you can take advantage of the good faith safe harbor. Now, I'm going to give you two caveats to this. The first caveat is, again, we have to be qualified with the program in order to request apprentices. So if we're not signatory with a craft and we say, send us apprentices and they say no, that is not a refusal or a denial because we didn't qualify to ask for those apprentices. And then the second caveat to this is it is crucially important that we document these efforts. Calling the hall or calling the program is not enough. They need to be documented. And so if we talk about what records that we need to keep, employers are responsible for keeping the records necessary to show, number one, the apprentice to journey worker ratio on each day that the apprentice was working was met. Again, I stress on each day. Number two, that the apprentice hours for construction, alteration, or repair were met. And number three, that the apprentice participation requirements were met. In other words, that even smaller contractors had one apprentice, one qualified apprentice on the show, on the program if they had four workers or more. Contractors relying on the good faith exception need to keep records reflecting those good faith efforts, including documents showing the request for apprentices and the response, if any, from the registered apprenticeship program. The penalties here can also be severe. If the requirements are not met, the contractor can pay the Secretary of Labor a penalty in the amount equal to $50 multiplied by the total number of labor hours for which the requirement was not satisfied for the construction, alteration, or repair work. Again, there's a higher level of penalty if the violation is willful or intentional. In situations involving intentional disregard of the requirement, the number becomes $500 times the total number of labor hours for which the requirement was not met. So it is multiplied by 10 if we intentionally disregard the law in this, in this area. So again, this is why documentation and safe harbor requirements are so important, because these penalties can be substantial. And so uh, at this point in time, does anybody have any questions about the apprenticeship or the prevailing wage requirements under the IRA? Any comments? Uh, Sorry, Andy, I had one question come in off offline, which is, um, do some or all of these prevailing wage rules, the IRA specific ones, apply to any other kinds of federal or federally funded jobs? Well, these rules are specific to projects that are getting tax incentives under the Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, there is a somewhat of a correlation between these rules and the Davis-Bacon requirements, particularly with regard to the new Davis-Bacon rulemaking. Uh, although it's not part of today's presentation, that's why at the end of this PowerPoint, I've also included just a summary of the Davis-Bacon changes or proposed changes in the rules, because Davis-Bacon will be intertwined with the IRA, even if it's not necessarily the same requirements. And that's because Department of Labor is actually the agency that the prevailing wage requirements are coming from. And those are the determinations that Treasury and the IRS are using for purposes of the IRA. So it'll only apply to programs receiving IRA funds, but Davis-Bacon has a lot of very analogous or comparative requirements. That's a good question. Okay. Uh, does anybody else have any questions or anything that we could talk about? Okay. Well, if, if nobody has anything else, then I'm going to say thank you both for being here, for asking good questions, and for participating. Again, there are a lot of moving parts to this, and so if this is a circumstance where you have any follow-up questions, please just shoot them through to Tim, and he'll shoot them through to me. Well, thanks again, Andy. Um, if you are still listening, please fill out that evaluation I put in the chat link. It's the latest chat post. Um, Andy, thanks a lot. I will circulate your slides and this video to the participants after the meeting. Okay. Thanks, Jim. Everybody take care. Everybody have a good rest of the day. Bye-bye. Thanks.